The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon. This is uh, John Perfect here. Just wanted to see if my fellow panelists, John and uh, um, Steve, can see the screen. Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Okay. Show me the screen. There we go. Got it. Okay, good. Looks good. All right, good stuff. I'm going to switch to presentation mode so it's a little bit bigger. A little bigger for you guys? Yes, sir. Yep. Okay, good stuff. All right, we'll stand by for a minute or two and then uh, get started right promptly at noon. Okay. Well, good afternoon. It's 12 o'clock. I'd uh, like to get started. Uh, welcome to the Multifamily and Energy Efficiency uh, Los Angeles Better Buildings Challenge um, noontime webinar. Um, I'd like to thank folks that uh, have joined um, and go ahead and get started uh, with the presentation with the fellow panelists. Um, I'll be going through a uh, short agenda at the beginning of this. I'm going to start out by doing a uh, a quick intro on the Better Buildings Challenge, and then we'll move into the content um, of the webinar here today. Just a quick check with uh, John, Neil, and, and Steve. Uh, you you can hear fine, my fellow panelists. Yep. Good Great. afternoon. Good afternoon. So, um, BBC is is uh, uh, thankful to its sponsors. First slide, you can see some of the major sponsors for LABBC and um, and they're listed there before you. Um, and uh, go on to the next slide. Um, first off, I'd like to uh, uh, give a few, actually, before we get into anything on the Better Buildings Challenge, just a few sort of housekeeping things. Uh, we're recording this webinar, as we almost always do, and it will be available uh, subsequently on the LABBC website, which is la bbc .org. Um, and uh, I'm sorry, la-bbc.com. Um, and uh, attendee lines during the course of the webinar will be muted. So if you have questions, best way to do that is to go ahead and submit those um, via the question box on your GoToWebinar, um, the dialog box uh, where it says questions with a little arrow next to it. Um, we will hopefully have time to answer questions at the end of the webinar. That's the way it's planned, and uh, we'll tackle those when we when we arrive there. Quick intro. Uh, my name is John Perfit. I'm director of uh, multifamily for the Los Angeles Better Buildings Challenge. I've uh, been working uh, with the BBC for the last year, focused exclusively on uh, multifamily, both affordable and market rate. Um, and uh, I'm joined today uh, in this brief webinar by two other gentlemen. One is John Neal with AEA, the Association for Energy Affordability, um, and John is an energy analyst, uh, analyst there, as you can see, and as well as Stephen Starks, who's the uh, group manager for the mass markets at LA Department of Water and Power. So um, they'll each be uh, tackling a portion of this um, presentation and some of these slides. Uh, subsequently, I will start off and then transition to both John and Steve. Um, so just a quick uh, 
intro and, and outline of the Better Buildings Challenge. Uh, the Better Buildings Challenge is, is at its heart a leadership initiative. Um, it, it endeavors to uh, encourage and recognize and facilitate and foster um, buildings enrolling in the program and committing to uh, improving energy efficiency dramatically in the not too distant future. Um, uh, we were we are in the process of enrolling more than 60 million square feet of uh, uh, buildings in the city of Los Angeles uh, with a goal to by 2035 or and more immediately I should say as we'll see in, a, in the next slide uh, uh, reductions of uh, or, uh, energy efficiency improvements of 20 percent I should say and by 2020 and then um, by 2035 30 percent reduction um, more specifically 2035 reduced energy use per square foot for all building types by 30 percent is really so working together with partners working with stakeholders working with policymakers um, partnering up with uh, uh, organizations to figure out ways to improve energy efficiency in the built environment in, in Los Angeles is really uh, the primary uh, focus for the uh, Better Buildings Challenge. Um, you can see sort of the uh, the pathway that we're, we're trying to get along or to go along to get to these 20% reductions based on a 2009 baseline is generally what we use, trying to reduce uh, and get more efficient to that 20, 20 goal of 20% uh, more efficiency. Um, so we're sort of a, uh, the Better Buildings Challenge is sort of a local chapter, if you will, of um, the National Better Buildings Challenge, um, which is a national competition as we are here locally to recognize and reward and um, uh, um, foster a healthy competition amongst building owners, developers, property managers to uh, compete on the basis of improving energy efficiency. Um, we provide, as you'll see in a subsequent slide, um, a variety of different supportive services and have different recognition uh, events and opportunities as part of our mission. And here they are, some of the things at its core that the Better Buildings Challenge does, um, starting on the left at like 10 o'clock, basically. Um, the Better Buildings Challenge, BBC, is the kind of lead organization supporting the um, existing buildings um, benchmarking ordinance as it's called the uh, energy efficiency ordinance that is now being implemented within the city of Los Angeles that is uh, uh, a, a variety of different uh, uh, regulations uh, requiring buildings uh, to become more efficient as well as disclosing their energy consumption uh, over the going forward I should say. Um, BBC also participates directly in um, putting together project development plans in conjunction with capital planning as well as uh, refinancing opportunities and so forth, um, ways to make buildings uh, more efficiency and plan for um, energy retrofits. We have a variety of um, advisory services available um, for free uh, related to technical matters, uh, things such as water, uh, and um, benchmarking and a variety of other um, technical uh, issues that uh, building owners and, uh, and operators encounter. Um, one of the things we also do that I've mentioned is uh, we have uh, awards and recognition program. We're actively involved in a variety of different uh, events, including, which you'll hear me talk about at the end of the webinar, um, a uh, recognition event uh, related to awards uh, for outstanding projects and, and the like. Um, we also interface with and work with a variety of different uh, financing sources as they relate to different types of buildings, be they commercial, be they uh, multifamily, and with a particular emphasis on accessing credit for uh, energy efficiency related improvements. Um, and we're uh, constantly working with and interfacing with a variety of different um, utilities and other um, agencies that provide uh, incentives, programs, rebates, and so, rebates, and so forth. So in essence, those are some of the core functions uh, that the LABBC carries out. 
Um, if you're looking for information, it's easy. Um, we'd love to talk to you about joining the challenge. It's, uh, uh, it's free. There are a lot of benefits to doing it. Um, uh, there are no commitments. Um, it's a good faith effort to commit to these energy efficiency uh, targets um, and, and charting a way to, to get there is sort of what we specialize in. So you can um, contact us at a uh, email address that you see on the screen. Um, you can join up um, and jump in right uh, immediately into project development related discussions. Um, and we'll begin at that course uh, uh, at that point, uh, uh, providing uh, resources and access to a variety of different um, tools and events and so forth. Um, the goal there is to move Los Angeles, city of Los Angeles, in, in a direction of becoming um, the greenest big city in the U.S. So I'll pause just briefly um, and take a minute to just outline what we're going to talk about here today um, during this uh, webinar. Um, it's kind of divided into um, four different pieces, um, although there are five, five items on here. The top two items are really going to be a profile of um, the, the multifamily housing stock uh, in the city of Los Angeles, uh, and then sort of layered into that and included in that is recent um, analysis and findings that were provided by uh, an energy efficiency potential study carried out by Optima. Uh, I'll be uh, walking through uh, those slides, then we'll transition to a update and sort of projection on the future by AEA and John Neal regarding the uh, low income weatherization program uh, funded by, um, as folks know, probably the cap and trade program, which has just recently been re-upped and has had some uh, rather successful auctions more uh, most recently. Um, and then Steve Starks uh, will give us a uh, overview um, in sort of a two-part uh, presentation on current programs that are relevant uh, and uh, proven successful for multifamily application. Um, and then uh, we'll talk a bit about um, forward plans uh, that the department has, Department of Water Power, specifically as it relates to what they're calling the low income customer access program. And then I'll um, take the mic again and um, talk briefly about a recent uh, project that was that is under construction um, that accessed a variety of different funding sources. And we'll talk about sort of what was learned uh, and some of the outcomes of um, that project um, accessing those funding sources. So what I wanted to do is um, first give a, a baseline uh, overview of um, the housing stock uh, in the city of Los Angeles as it relates to multifamily. And um, I extracted a variety of different um, uh, pieces of information from a few different sources, um, namely the uh, Elevate Energy market characterization study that was done here in Los Angeles. Um, in in conjunction sort of with the Optima uh, energy uh, study as well. Um, also, uh, some information was gleaned from the City of Los Angeles cons Consolidated Plan, um, the years 2013 through 17, as well as the, some information about the rent stabilization ordinance from the um, uh, review of the RSO, the rent stabilization program done by the uh, Economic Roundtable. So, it's a large uh, housing stock. Um, the number isn't 100% accurate, so, but uh, more than 760 um, multifamily units, and those are you know, smaller units to the larger high-rise buildings. Um, and as you can see, the next item below that uh, indicates that a good chunk of uh, the buildings, 68% um, of these buildings are you know, 20 units or less. Um, and um, I should point out that you know that's a, that's a big chunk, and, and, and likely those buildings will not be subject to the uh, energy efficiency ordinance um, because they are most likely less than 20,000 square feet in total building area. But uh, that's a, somewhat of an aside. So um, as it relates to sort of um, the focus that we have uh, here, and then Steve Starks does too in terms of 
DWP going forward. 61% of these uh, of five um, five unit or bigger buildings are actually located in low income areas. So there's a good chunk of these kind of medium up to the larger buildings being actually in uh, low income areas. Um, in terms of uh, the size, um, uh, not surprising, 75% plus uh, are one and two bedroom units. Um, those are the core of the housing stock. There are uh, a chunk of three bedroom units out there, but the core are one and two bedrooms. Not surprising. Um, John Neal will talk in AE a little bit more about uh, disadvantaged communities, but um, by the latest calculations, 40%, slightly more than that, of the units, multifamily units within the city of Los Angeles are actually located in what are considered to be disadvantaged communities as uh, as defined by Cal EPA, uh, which uses a variety of different um, uh, variables um, to kind of determine these disadvantaged community uh, areas. Uh, importantly, uh, about the housing stock, 80% uh, of the stock was built. Um, that's a big number. Um, pre-1978, which is sort of the uh, beginning of the era of kind of modern energy code. So a good chunk of the housing stock is um, is smaller and, and was built um, pre-1978. Um, about 11% of all low-income buildings, i.e. buildings that are uh, occupied by lower-income households, are what are called traditional uh, affordable housing units that have some type of um, uh, controls in place or some type of rental subsidy, meaning they're public housing or there are um, uh, rent um, restriction covenants uh, recorded against the property. Um, study after study has been showing in, in, in the market that as uh, covenants run their course on these traditional affordable housing units. Many of them uh, are facing um, conversion to market. Um, and uh, once the, com the, the uh, affordability covenant has sort of burned off and run its course. Um, traditional affordable housing now uses 55 years. Um, in the past, it has used less than that. And some of those covenants, um, depending on funding source sources, have um, have, have begun to burn off and, and units are converting to market rate. Um, the preponderance of, uh, uh, of the population in, in the city of Los Angeles are, are renters and tenants at somewhere around 62% of the population. Um, depending on sort of the survey and, uh, that you read and, and study that you read, a good chunk of those um, uh, Fifty percent are rent burdened, meaning that they're paying uh, a large portion or more than a healthy portion, as determined by um, a variety of different sources. Uh, uh, they're paying more of their income for rent than is otherwise sort of normal or wouldn't cause a burden on that household. The average household size in the city of Los Angeles uh, in these 760, approximately 760,000 buildings is 3.48 uh, people. So, you know, families are the average with with um, you know, two two children potentially um, and one or two adults. Um, and the average uh, length of stay uh, is is um, I shouldn't say the average, most tenants in terms of the highest percentage stay in a rental unit in the city of Los Angeles from two to four years. Um, and then as it relates to uh, some additional background on, on RSO, the Rent Stabilization Ordinance, about 60% of the folks that are living in multifamily units in the city um, are in what's called RSO units or uh, ha are subject to rent control. So. Um, that, that's a variety of different things, including relocation assistance um, in the event that the uh, the tenancy was terminated, um, or also uh, constraining the uh, amount that the annual rent could be in increased, generally speaking, by an increase of 3% on an annual basis. That's the way it's been over the last um, at least five years. And then the data sources that I uh, mentioned are, are located uh, at the bottom of the slide. 
Um, so the objectives of the uh, uh, potential study, uh, the study of energy efficiency savings or energy efficiency potential, I should say, study was to uh, use the Elevate market characterization study to evaluate you know, kind of the efficacy of various energy efficiency measures, what what would work based on what we know um, about the market, um, about the building stock and the marketplace itself, and then try to establish some findings regarding the potential for energy efficiency savings in Los Angeles multifamily buildings. And then with those findings in mind, of course, make some recommendations on targeting uh, future uh, energy efficiency programs. So let's uh, take a look at some of the um, outcomes as it relates to um, performance of City of LA um, multifamily buildings. Um, not surprising, uh, pre-1978, pre-modern energy code, medium-sized buildings, which are those 5K to 20,000 square foot buildings, have the highest median energy use intensity. Um, th those are the ones that are, um, you know, based on sort of a standardized calculations, the ones that are kind of consuming the most. Um, the larger uh, buildings, uh, perhaps built a little bit later, um, you know, uh, they, the ones greater than 20,000 square feet have the highest median uh, use for use of electricity. Um, interestingly, uh, geographically, um, 50% of the highest EUI buildings, um, energy use intensity buildings, are located in the San Fernando Valley. I think everyone can probably immediately make the connection, logical connection, that that's a function of um, the climate in the San Fernando Valley and, and use of, uh, of air conditioning. Um, what's very interesting to me is that 40% of the highest EU buildings are indeed located in South LA in South LA planning areas, um, which I think represents um, a tremendous opportunity uh, going forward, especially um, for DWPs um, programs um, for equity and, and additional investment in energy efficiency in lower income communities. Okay, I'm gonna to transition to the next slide. Um, sort of, a few of the of the measures that were examined during the course of the potential study uh, was in unit and common area lighting, lighting um, the use of uh, smart thermostats that were um, able to adjust temperature and respond to a variety of different factors and weren't able to uh, when enabled via Wi-Fi and so forth, and then um, refrigerators uh, replacement of refrigerators. Uh, on the gas side of the equation. Um, Commercial clothes washers were uh, measures that were examined, um, and then insulation uh, of the um, uh, water heater itself, as well as water pipes, um, hot water, obviously, domestic hot water um, pipes and heater, and then uh, the application or use of low flow fixtures um, for kitchens, bathrooms, shower heads, and so forth. So here's some of the findings uh, that came out of this, the uh, uh, initial findings um, that there are some significant uh, gas savings potential uh, in the pre-1950 buildings. Um, there could be some real marginal effects by the application of uh, investment in, um, in efficiency as it relates to uh, appliances and otherwise using uh, gas. The larger buildings, one of the other findings in the larger buildings that are built post-1950, there's a uh, significant potential for um, uh, electricity savings. Um, and not surprising, um, dovetailing what, with what came out was in the other slide, is that um, there are energy savings um, that could be uh, achieved, significant ones, by targeting measures to the San Fernando Valley. Um, as I mentioned before, programs targeted at South LA, also because of its high EUI, um, those are gonna have uh, significant marginal effects uh, as well. Um, the measures studied uh, did have a, uh, a positive cost benefit uh, result. Um, so they're you know, economically sound in a lot of ways in terms of 
uh, returning benefit uh, based on cost. Um, the highest potential for electricity savings, you know, going back to, um, you know, the kind of bullet point number two or box number two um, is the in-unit lighting. Um, lighting has a, a great ability to move the needle um, in the multifamily sector and um, programs targeting that will have a uh, significant impact. Gas savings, um, the highest potential there is to insulate water heaters and pipes and um, that will move uh, the needle in terms of gas savings. So in essence, sort of pulling this all together, programs improving and replacing water heaters, lighting and air conditioners, including thermostats, could uh, provide significant impact um, you know, if those were bundled up together in the form of a program or individually. So uh, with that, I'm going to go ahead, uh, the way we sort of organized this was kind of a, a characterization and background on um, current situation here in, in Los Angeles. And then we have kind of a local funder and that's DWP of, of rebate programs. And then uh, a statewide one in AEA working on behalf of the state of California. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, transition the next few slides uh, over to John Neal with AEA to talk about uh, kind of the state of uh, the LIWIP program currently and what he sees down the pike in terms of uh, funding and a variety of other things for LIWIP. Go ahead, John. Thanks, John. Um, let's start off on the first or the second slide here and um, sort of talk about um, the YWIP program, the Low Income Weatherization Program um, overview. So um, as you said, it's a, it's a state funded um, cap and trade uh, program that provides incentives for both energy efficiency work as well as solar PV and solar thermal. Um, it's administered through uh, CSD, the, uh, California Department of Community Services and Development, and then um, delivered by uh, AEA across the state. And what I'm gonna talk about today is sort of the first round findings, um, and then um, some expectations we have for um, future, future funds and future rounds. Um, as John mentioned before, um, there is the California EPA uh, Enviro screen, which identifies disadvantaged communities. I was gonna put a screenshot in here of what LA looks like, and I, I left that out, but um, in general, the, the way that that map works, if you're not familiar with it, is it takes a lot of different um, factors into account to identify um, a disadvantaged community, and that includes uh, air quality, income, and a variety of other um, details. The big picture for LA is that the majority of LA um, does sort of fall into a disadvantaged community. So there's quite a bit of opportunity in terms of applying this program uh, to the Los Angeles region. Um, the program's also for multifamily buildings and uh, uh, buildings have to meet an affordability requirement. So that could mean um, having a deed restriction as John mentioned earlier. Um, and then there are other ways to comply with the program to show either income verification or um, a method of maintaining rents at a sort of reasonable level um, for a minimum of 10 years. So there's a variety of different ways for both uh, sort of market rate, or I wouldn't say market rate, but sort of street affordable, non-deed restricted properties, um, as well as um, deed restricted properties to go through the program. Let's take a look at the next slide. So going over some highlights of the program, there's a lot of details, but um, the main highlights are that we can really incentivize um, any energy savings measure. Um, so we're not um, focused on, you know, whether it's coming from gas or electric savings. Um, we wanted to focus to make sure that the program was going to help deliver um, savings to residents. And I'm sure everybody on the call here is sort of familiar with the split incentive issue where owners are sometimes maybe less interested or a little bit more reluctant to make you know massive investments in um, measures that will ultimately um, help their tenants bottom line but they have no method for recouping um, that investment and so we um, intentionally made the incentives higher 
for tenant savings measures to try and help offset that. Um, another uh, benefit of the program is that the funds are coming through cap and trade revenue, which is sort of separate from um, investor owned utility uh, funds. And so the um, incentives from LIWAP and the incentives from utilities can typically stack on top of each other, um, sort of providing a larger pool of funds uh, for projects. And then we um, have a single point of contact model where a technical analyst will help the owner um, go through the entire LIWIP program, um, you know, both securing the incentive, providing um, sort of uh, energy audit um, and technical assistance throughout the, throughout the process. Let's take a look at the next slide. Okay, so here's sort of our round one um, high level results. Um, we delivered around 17.8 uh, million in incentives. Um, and the projects were pretty well distributed across the state. So we, we got about, um, uh, let's see, 14 counties. So 14 counties is about half of the eligible counties in the state. Um, so we feel pretty good that we got a, um, a good, a good touch for the for the first round of the program, and we're hoping that we can, in the upcoming rounds, um, get some projects in the remaining counties as well, so we can try and get a good distribution of projects across the state. Um, served about uh, over 4,000 households, and of those, um, 1,600 um, all received um, solar PV benefit as well. And that's another um, sort of unique aspect of the program is that the incentive for solar PV, um, like the split incentive issue I talked about earlier, um, we recognize that a, you know, typical PV incentive programs typically might not be robust enough for the owner to invest in a PV system that's gonna offset their residents' uh, uh, consumption. And so we uh, did our best to make the incentive for tenant PV uh, free for, for owners to install. Um, so free uh, tenant solar PV. Um, and the sort of net result of that is that um, of all the systems that were installed, um, about 80% of our systems uh, that were installed offset tenant loads. And the flip side of that is the MASH program, uh, which doesn't sort of have that tenant kicker. And they're um, typically sort of the opposite. Uh, the majority of their systems um, are usually um, offsetting owner loads. Um, we're projecting around $27 million in savings um, in utility costs over the next 15 years. And, um, you know, one of the main goals of the program is trying to reduce um, carbon dioxide. So we're projecting around 3,500 metric tons of carbon being saved uh, per year. Take a look at the next slide. Okay, so some lessons lessons learned from the first uh, round, first year of the program. Um, we found early, um, I don't know if anybody on the call was um, working with us at the beginning of the program, but initially the program started off with um, calculating incentives based on the savings to investment ratio of the project. And we changed pretty early on to just switching to a greenhouse gas based incentive uh, would be a more sort of flexible and sort of directly linear way of calculating incentives for projects. So um, we will calculate the um, greenhouse gas savings for you know, any measure that's being considered on a project and tie an incentive to that um, based on how many uh, projected greenhouse gases are saved. And so what we found, the, the sort of end result of that is that the um, incentives are relatively flexible. We're fuel agnostic. So um, that allows our program to allow um, owners to fuel switch if they're interested in fuel switching. Um, and we found a pretty good adoption of the use of heat pump equipment, both for space conditioning as well as uh, domestic hot water equipment, because uh, we found that that typically saved a 
tremendous amount of greenhouse gases. So we found that there was a pretty large adoption of the use of heat pump equipment under the program. Um, we also had both sort of small targeted scopes as well as deeper scopes going through the program. So it wasn't um, just you know massive type of rehabs that were leveraging the program. We also had quite a few owners that you know really just went in and looked at upgrading a few systems. So maybe they'd upgrade a boiler plant or their windows and lighting. Um, so both of them were able to uh, go through the program. Um, I mentioned the PV system, the tenant PV offset being successful. That was true in the IOU territory, um, but we're still seeing a barrier for that in Los Angeles because um, as of now, um, LADWP doesn't have a virtual net metering um, uh, component uh, tariff available that would allow uh, sort of one PV system to go on say a 20 unit building and allocate those credits to each resident. Um, so that's a barrier that we are trying to overcome um, with you know, finding ways to do direct meter connections where everybody has their own um, connection. Um, and I think there's also sort of a um, alignment here that as you get into a denser, more urban environment, your available roof area sort of goes down. And so we found that in the Central Valley or places where there was a little bit more land um, and parking areas, things like carport um, solar and rooftop solar, um, typically there's more space to put that in. So that was a little bit more successful. And then we also found during the program that not all owners had enough cash on hand to cash flow the project. And so sort of midway through, we had to think through ways to deliver uh, phased incentives over the course of the project. So owners were never out of pocket sort of too much. And I think a good point to make here too is that the program um, isn't intended um, to always pay for 100% of the project cost. So depending on what the owner wants to do and how sort of effective it is at saving greenhouse gases, there may be more or less um, owner investment that's needed. Um, a couple other things I didn't include in the slide, but wanted to mention as well was that um, in the affordable world, there's you know a lot of typically the um, upgrades that happen at a building, uh, the major upgrades that happen in a building happen at a recentication event uh, where the building goes through a recapitalization, refinance, and, and you know, typically gets rehabbed. And we've found that you know that discussion with those owners when they're going through those events usually sort of happens right when they're they're getting sort of their planning pulled together, and that timing doesn't always align well with program timelines. And so we're hoping that longer program timelines and having conversations early and often with developers will allow us to, instead of learning about a project sort of you know last minute to try and layer in our funds, we can engage people sooner to um, sort of start planning for how the um, incentives could help an owner maybe go a little bit above and beyond what their um, standard rehab might be. Let's go to the next slide. So some good news and some bad news on what's next for the program. Um, if you don't have a reservation at this point, the bad news is that our current uh, bucket of dollars is earmarked for projects. So we currently the remaining funds that we have are fully earmarked. Um, the good news for us as a program is that we do have a really strong pipeline built for um, the greater LA County. Uh, so we have over 3,600 units that are sort of expressed interest and are waiting to um, go through the program. And that's great because uh, programmatically, um, for all the reasons that John mentioned earlier about the sort of needs in LA, uh, we really want to increase participation um, in future rounds um, uh, from the LA, LA region. Um, so what we're hoping for, John mentioned that there is, uh, where we're six sort of successful um, auctions recently. Um, and we sort of looked at this yesterday or the day before and the um, cap and trade auction that happened recently, I think had the 
the highest overall revenue of any auction that's happened to date. So we're hoping that uh, that um, will hopefully also translate to a strong um, funding for the program uh, from the legislature uh, this fall. And depending on how uh, that allocation is made, that, you know, if it's a significant amount of money, that's going to be great. We can serve more projects. And if it isn't, um, you know, as robust as we'd like it to be, um, then we'll have to just, you know, do our best to try and leverage as many sources as we can, um, like the LADWP uh, programs that Steve's going to talk about, um, SoCal gas programs, et cetera, to try and stack as many dollars as we can to do as much work as we can. Um, and then regardless of how much we get, the program will get funded through uh, 2020. So uh, we will be, we'll have a presence and we'll be able to sort of work with owners and then uh, the amount of money will really dictate um, how many projects that we can do. And then if you could go to the next slide here, um, if you can sort of navigate over to that website, that will allow you to sort of learn more about the um, the program. It'll have a link to the Cal Enviro screen. So if you have a property or properties, you can look up and see if they fall in the red shaded um, disadvantaged community track area. Um, and you can also submit an interest form there that will allow you to sort of get in line uh, for um, for funds. Um, depending on you know how the funding allocation works. Okay, John, thanks a lot. Uh, appreciate it. Uh, uh, we're going to switch over to Steve Starks from uh, LADWP to uh, walk us through some relevant programs for multifamily, and then talk a bit about future direction for uh, LA Department of Water and Power. Steve. Thank you, John. And first of all, I want to uh, welcome uh, the attendees, our guests this afternoon. I appreciate you um, participating in the webinar. And then thanks again to John Perfett and John Neal for laying the groundwork for for uh, what I'm going to talk about briefly. And that's just a few of the programs and the initiatives we're involved in uh, with Los Angeles Department of Water and Power. Um, we have long since recognized that it has, has always been a challenge to find the proper program fit for this particular housing stack, the multifamily customer. And, never, and, and yet that represents more than 62% of our customer base. And it, it's been a unique challenge, largely because some of it is classified as commercial, basically the common areas. And then you, of course, you have the residential units and that is classified in our residential uh, uh, spectrum of programs that we offer. And oftentimes um, our efforts are pretty much driven by our ability to make a, a, a sound, business case as to why we need to pursue these endeavors but it's 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 changing the landscape is changing very quickly and so we're we're very pleased that that more resources and partnership opportunities are presenting themselves first of which you see here's a socal gas leddwp partnership we have in excess of 30 partnerships uh, with socal gas we have a very common and extremely large overlapping um customer base all of our customers that, ex that, that reside in LADWP service territory are customers of SoCal Gas. And so while there had been a few impediments that kind of prevented us from, from partnering in times past, uh, fortunately we've overcome those and we've been able to put some um, partnerships in place that have allowed us to better serve our common customer with a, a full, complete, um, array of services that affect all of the fuel sources, natural gas on SoCal Gas's side, and the electricity and the water on our side. Um, one of which is we're focused on very much uh, what John Neal was discussing in his efforts. Uh, we have one uh, energy savings assistance program. And this particular one, this is our going on our second year in partnership with SoCal Gas where we're, uh, they're the lead agency and we're allowing them to utilize their resources to target uh, the specific eligible uh, housing stock that fits the profile uh, that's essentially serving the low income customers in our in our community and uh, we're providing uh, efficiency upgrades in both the water area the electricity as well as the gas uh, we initiated that partnership in 2015 about mid-year and so far it's been uh, a resounding success 
And uh, we've served, in, in fact, this is the update is we have actually exceeded 6,800 units served and we're going strong. More are signing up every day. Um, we made an internal commitment to continue to fund it. And as we transition to the next slide, we'll begin to talk to you about some other efforts that we have um, that is one of our legacy programs that it was an outgrowth, in fact, of what used to be known as the Weatherization Assistance Program that was ARA funded. And in our Home in in Energy Improvement Program, we have two uh, program channels or two customer segments or housing segments that we're trying to address. The home itself, single family residents, as well as multifamily. Both housing types can participate. Customers that reside in those particular housing stocks that I just identified can participate. We have a limited number of efficiency upgrade opportunities, um, some of which include, at least for the single family residential ones, some uh, insulation upgrades, lighting, and we make every effort to touch as much on the, on the water system as possible. Um, we do have other rebates and other programs that would complement our efforts um, in the Home Energy Improvement Program, but this program is free to our customers um, every customer is eligible in both the multi-residential segment as well as in our um, single family residential segment. And we try to specifically target our low income areas first so that they can receive the benefit and so that we can make, insure, make sure that we're equitable in the distribution of our efficient our, uh, rebate funds uh, throughout our customer base. So we do target the lower economic incomes first and then we spread out and, and offer it to everyone else. Um, that particular effort utilizes an internal workforce, LADWP, and a, a small smattering of, of, of outside contractors that we've been allowed um, to um, utilize under that effort. Now, as we transition to the next program that I'd like to talk about on the next slide, um, this is the one that's relatively new. Um, we were asked by some of the city leaders uh, in anticipation, particularly in anticipation of a relatively hot summer. And for those that reside in the city of Los Angeles and in our regional area, you've heard uh, that they are forecasting a longer than expected summer. And so there were a number of efforts that were being discussed as to how best to assist our ratepayers in our residential sector and both the uh, single family residential customer as well as our multi rep residential um, customer stock. And so one of the things we came up with um, is a, particularly in the low income area, some of the areas that John Neal and his, his team targets trying to impact those multifamily um, uh, landlords that, um, that provide affordable housing to the citizens of LA. So we came up with um, a window air conditioner recycling program. And so we have one for the single family customers and then we have another one that we are currently trying to design and develop that is exclusively for the multifamily owner. Now, those particular ones, what we're gonna do is we're going to have a core of staff that is um, that will go out and canvas based upon some geocoding, some enviro scanning, identifying those lower economic um, uh, areas. We will overlay that with the data that we have from the county assessor identifying some of the affordable housing stock, and then we'll have that opportunity to go and meet with those property owners, try to um, and put together an incentive package that has sufficient to pay down a significant portion of the AC replacement unit, as well as a, a, a sharing some of the costs and labor that they will, that will be required in order for them to install. So that, particular program is one that we're in the process of developing. We actually did a, uh, we had a pilot run um, where we had here in the Los, uh, at our um, downtown office building where we sent out a number of um, circulars as well as email blasts and invited customers who were eligible to um, bring their AC unit. And then we were offering them rebates with the multifamily we're actually going to go reach out directly, establish a list of, of eligible providers, I mean, of eligible participants. And as long as we can get a significant portion of those, 
And essentially, we will state set that up with the the property owner. They can stage those units. We'd like to get them all out within a, a few days period. So it's going to require some effort, depending on how large the building is. But most of the older housing stock in the multifamily um, segment, they're the ones that typically would have a window room AC. And so it's been largely well received thus far with a little bit of the sampling that we've had out there. So we hope to uh, have a full blown program going into 2018 that will work with our multifamily. And as we transition to the next slide, we'll, you'll see a couple of other programs that historically um, had its origins and its roots in our single family. And we have expanded that to include uh, our multifamily customers uh, as well. So one of this, which is the refrigerator turn-in program, which is one that any customer can participate in. But one of the things we've been focusing on with the multifamily, there are some that provide the refrigerators as basically you see some of the semi-furnished apartments. One of the elements that they provide as a benefit to their prospective tenants. And we have worked with a number of uh, property owners that actually own the units generally in the lower economic areas. And we have wholesale switched them out for a highly efficient Energy Star model. Uh, and we've switched out uh, with, with housing authority, a lot of the lower income, a lot of the HUD buildings. So we've been very active and aggressively assisting them. And that helps bring down that cost uh, to the property owner and ultimately to the, because many of those buildings are what we call master metered. There's a single meter that simply measures everything in the building. So that's a cost benefit to them that they would then pass on to the customers uh, and the, uh, their, their tenants. And the other one is our refrigerator exchange program, which um, we will actually go out and, and swap those out to civic institutions, the multifamily. And going back to, and speak, I was actually speaking about the, the, the exchange in the first one. Actually, the first one, the retire is an opportunity to remove those old energy guzzling units and to receive a rebate. Uh, so there are some owners that have a particular model that they want that we may not uh, provide an incentive for, um, but they certainly have the opportunity to have those removed and um, we recycle them in the, the highest uh, appliance recycling protocol available in the country. And um, we remove those and recycle them and then provide them with a rebate. And as I indicated on the other uh, portion of the slide, multifamily owners that provide the units for their tenants that would like to swap them out. Um, that's been a huge benefit uh, for them. And so we were very excited uh, for that opportunity to partner with them in that area. And as a utility, one of the things that we're constantly trying to do is how, how best to, to spread our limited dollars, because they're ratepayer funds. And so we always have to come up with the, the most effective and beneficial business case because we're utilizing ratepayer dollars. And many ratepayers oftentimes might echo, you know, why don't you use that money to, you know, to drop my, drop my rates? And, and so we want everyone to be able to, to participate. We want everyone to have access. And as we transition to my very last slide, uh, before I turn it back over to John, one of the, the most recent initiatives that is still in its infancy, uh, we have a task force, internal task force. We're actually inviting some um, property owners, such as perhaps some that may be participants in this webinar um, to one of our facilities to kind of give us some guidance and some insight as to some of the things and some of the ways as to how we might more effectively uh, as a utility uh, serve them as our end use customers. And this particular program has been uh, called the low income customer access. And if you can imagine a Venn diagram, we may have single family, we'll have multifamily, and then we'll have the inner, the overlapping interlocking circle of low income that affects both single family and the uh, multifamily housing stock. And so we're in the process of developing that program, establishing the goals, which you see is really we want to create um, a greater degree of equity between our low income and our multifamily as it relates to our program, connect them more. We do a fairly decent job at doing it, but we recognize that we can do much better. And so that is our commitment. And the leaders of the city have, have, have put that challenge to us, and we intend uh, to try to move forward. We want to provide our low-income customers or advocacy groups with some clear guidance and support structures, which means we may have to take 
largely disparate programs across our portfolio and create unique program offerings for these particular target groups. And so we're certainly prepared and committed to do that. And we're going over the next several months, going to continue to find the best opportunity, the best program model, the best program channel um, so that we can support and get some much needed services to this segment of our customer base. And so um, uh, the last one just it just is a, a clear indication and reiteration of our commitment to really um, put resources uh, behind this effort to have a positive impact on this segment of our customer base. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Ms. Perfett. Thank you, uh, Steve. Uh, yeah, not too much time remaining. I wanted to, I, I haven't checked to see if there's any questions, but I, I, I just wanted to bring this all home by uh, uh, giving some real numbers from a real project in our marketplace. Um, so this is a, a project uh, that is under construction right now. Um, it's a 61 unit project in South LA, scattered site, two different locations, 41 units, 20 units on the other one, built not uh, a long time ago, but built rather in 1991. Uh, so not that long ago, but um, definitely long enough to be uh, in need of uh, rehabilitation. Uh, this was a recapitalization as it's called, which is basically a fancy way of saying it was refinanced. It included some public funds. It includes some quasi private funds in the form of a tax credit, uh, as well as traditional debt as well. Um, there were, in the end, through accessing a variety of different pro programs, primarily LIWIP, um, nine energy uh, measures were implemented. Some of those were going to be implemented uh, before accessing LIWIP, uh, but to not to the extent to uh, they are using the LIWIP incentives. And those are cool roof, um, solar thermal, so the uh, attacking the water heater and having that work less by uh, um, you know harvesting the, the sun and the ability to heat water. Uh, in unit LEDs, low flow fixtures, of course, garage and common area LEDs were a big mover. You know, high efficiency water heater, you know, stepped it up from what was originally planned there. And then um, I repeated, excuse me, solar thermal. Um, again, but we also insulated uh, the water pipes, the hot water pipes. So what did that yield uh, from an energy efficiency savings? One location, 20 unit pro property uh, is projecting a 50% energy efficiency savings. Um, the other property, the 41 unit properties, projecting 40% savings. We also, because we had an investor already in the project to buy the low income housing tax credits, they were amenable to also paying for uh, solar tax credits, uh, which helped uh, with the economics. Um, so which one of these measures sort of moved the needle the most? Well, solar thermal by far had the largest uh, energy efficiency impact by, you know, using the sun and, you know, allowing the uh, water heater to work a lot less it has a huge impact and really moves the needle. It followed after that by the LED garage lighting and tenant heat pumps um, were the next two biggest items in terms of uh, energy efficiency improvements. Well, that's great. What did that translate to uh, for the developer team? Well, what that meant is that we were able to bring in, uh, if you will, a new construction source. That's sort of the way that I view it in sort of the development parlance. Um, it's, it's another source to be able to pay for these things. And we were able to get $330,000 uh, all packaged together uh, once we, um, you know, actually install these improvements and measures. Um, so it's a pretty sizable amount. And it's important to note for folks uh, that do development or do refinancing, these Payments for LIWIP are um, paid after inspection of these improvements, and uh, these uh, payments do not have to be deferred in sort of the larger uh, picture. Um, the the money is available as soon as the um, uh, improvements are installed and they're inspected. So, uh, you know, everybody that, not everybody, I should say, folks know that oftentimes developers are required to defer um, certain fees and so forth. Uh, in this case, it would be a capital source that the developer team could access um, without deferring it. 
So um, with that, uh, we're at um, time check. We're at uh, 12.57, not leaving a ton of time for questions. I'm going to, um, I thought I was going to. Yes, I am going to go look and see if there's any uh, questions that have been posted in the um, uh, in the question panel dialog box. Um, we have one question uh, from Andy Manley, uh, Promise Energy, saying, when will DWP be launching virtual net metering, I believe, VNEM? Um, I'll turn that one over to uh, John, and perhaps you can weigh in to Steve. Yeah, this is John. I um, don't know if there's a current timeline for switching over, but Steve might have more information on that. Uh, thank you. The answer to that is uh, no, it's been discussed, but um, there's been no definitive timeline as to when that is going to occur. Um, the solar group is focused on a number of solar initiatives, not the least of which community solar. And so virtual uh, net metering has been mentioned, uh, but again, there's been nothing definitive stated as of yet, but it is in the, on the discussion table. Um, sorry, Andy, keep keep uh, banging the drum on that. I know it's a, it's a, it's an important thing, especially after we looked at the marketplace and how many folks are renters and how uh, things like solar thermal could really move the needle. Appreciate the question. Um, uh, there are, this is, I believe a question for Steve Stark. Uh, are there any uh, programs that DWP has that are specific for condominiums? Uh, the, the condominium, the townhouse, the apartment building, we all consider them all multifamily. So we don't have an exclusive carve out for a condominium or a townhouse, which are generally owner occupied multifamily uh, structures, uh, but they can participate in all the other programs that we have. And when we do our outreach through our multifamily efforts, um, some through our, um, our commercial direct install, where we do upgrades on lighting, um, offers that we have through our AC optimization program, which is available to all housing stock, both uh, single family and commercial. Those um, condominiums that have many of whom have individualized AC units, they can participate. We'll do the entire property. That's what ideally we would like to do. Uh, so no, there's no unique specific car about for condominiums, but they do fit within the concept and construct of the multifamily uh, structure customer. Uh, a follow-on question to that, Steve. To get more information, is there someone that could provide some information on that? A contact was the question, the follow-on question. For our multifamily efforts or uh, what specifically do we? Now, I can, you know, is my, did you leave my contact on there? Um, um, no, but the... Uh, I'll give my email, stephen.starks at ladwp.com. And then uh, whomever the requester is, they can they can reach out to me personally, and then I can at least send them in the right direction, if, if not provide them um, with a response. Uh, one other question here from Andy. Um, uh, I don't know if it's Andy. I think it's from Andy Manley. It's a good one. Uh, how do folks expect to get to zero net energy ZNE in 2020 for multifamily, you know, in absence of, uh, I imagine is, is the other part of the question, absent any kind of virtual net metering capacity or capability. Um, John, do you want to, do you want to field that in terms of, can you get to the talk of zero net energy without, you know, addressing this, you know, big problem of split incentive through virtual net metering? Good question. Um, I guess I would hope that if a building was, you know, not eligible, even if virtual net metering was, you know, potential, but maybe they didn't have a good roof or orientation, um, you know, I would hope that through electrification in the building and then improvement in the uh, renewability of the grid might help sort of achieve the same goal. So as LEDWP starts to source more and more renewable. Uh, energy, or you have things like community solar um, feeding into the grid, then you sort of might be able to achieve, you know, sort of net energy, net zero energy at um, sort of at the site, sort of that way. Um, okay, thanks, John. Um, 
I'm going to see no other questions. I'm going to go ahead and just do a plug real quickly here. Um, as I mentioned before, um, we are open uh, for the uh, uh, nomination of projects, portfolio of the year, overall project of the year, energy efficiency project of the year, or water efficiency project of the year um, for the LABBC awards. You can check it out online using the URL below um, la.bbc.com fourth annual innovation awards with hyphens in between. Um, and I would like to thank my panelists, fellow panelists, uh, John Neal of AEA, uh, Steve Sarks of uh, Department of Water and Power for your time and thoughts uh, and energy here today. Appreciate it. And um, I'd like to thank uh, all the folks that uh, logged into the webinar. Uh, as I mentioned before, this will be available online at LEBVC.com. Thank you and have a pleasant day. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.